that no matter what life may throw at us, no matter how difficult life is, that we can be well in the depths of our soul because of you. Father, we thank you for this beautiful song to remind us of that beautiful promise that you will always be with us through the valleys and on the mountaintops. And we praise you today for being God. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Being a parent uh, isn't for weak people. If you're going to be the parent God intends you to be, it's kind of hard sometimes. We talked uh, previously a few weeks ago about connections that matter, and particularly a connection with God, and how important that connection with God feeds all of our other connections. We talked about how we need to contact, connect with friends. And I'm going to try this again. didn't work out very well the first time. But how many of you have a friend? Oh, good. That's better. First service, there was only three people that had a friend. <laughs> Actually, I think it was only three people that were awake at that time, but that <laughs> however it worked out. But we talked about having connections with friends, and, and then last week we talked about how we need to have con connection with our spouse, and to follow that up is connecting, connecting with our kids. Now, I know uh, some of you here today, uh, your children are grown, uh, but you can still have connections with your kids and with your grandkids, uh, and you can make a difference. I got three outstanding examples of grandkids right here on, <laughs> on the front row here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. If you didn't know their parents, you would think they were outstanding, wouldn't you? Uh, well, they really knowing their parents makes them even more outstanding. <laughs> my son, and this is my son's son here, uh, on this end here. My son, uh, when he was uh, growing up full of himself, he's a big boy. Uh, and uh, he used to uh, jump dad every once in a while, you know, wrestle with dad. And, and he just initiated, he'd, he'd jump on me and I'd, we'd start wrestling and... and uh, it got to be harder and harder to win. You know, he got bigger and big, stronger all the time. Uh, you know, he was a weightlifting champion in high school and stuff like that. So he got, he got to be kind of tough. And the last time we wrestled, I had to cheat. And he said, Dad, you cheated. I said, yes, son. I am father. You are son. Father will win. <laughs> <laughs> no matter what it takes. Now, I'm not saying that's a good example for you to follow in raising your kids, <laughs> um, but it, it helped with us. He hasn't, he hasn't wrestled with me since. I think now he's afraid he might break me. <laughs> but raising kids is not always easy, is it? Uh, they're all so different, and they all have so many challenges today. I want to talk to you about how to connect with your kids today. And, and we're going to look here in Genesis chapter 1. If you uh, would turn with me, actually, uh, Genesis chapter 25, it should be. <laughs> I'm sorry, the references are wrong on the board on this slide. Uh, chapter 25 of Genesis. We're going to begin reading in verse uh, uh, number uh, 19, if you would turn with me there. Chapter 25. Verse 19. Would you stand in honor of God's word as we read it together? Genesis chapter 25, verse 19. Now these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of, of Bethel, of the Syrian of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Syrian, to be his wife. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah his wife conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two people shall be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other. And the older shall serve the younger. 
When her days were to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. And afterward his brother came forth with his hand, holding on to Esau's hill. So th his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a, a man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. And when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, Please, let me have a, a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore his name was called Edom. But Jacob said, First sell me your birthright. And Esau said, Behold, I'm about to die. So of what use then is a birthright to me? And Jacob said, First swear to me. And so he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Would you bow with me please in prayer? Father, we thank you for this example uh, of parents with children. Lord, I thank you that we can learn from all these examples in your word. And Lord, I pray, uh, Lord, that we might do uh, a great job of raising kids to know you and to serve you and, and to be healthy and active and able to do everything you declare you want them to do in their lives. And Father, I thank you for the potential in every child, every child that's here, every child represented by our families uh, here gathered in your name today. And help us, Lord, as influencers in those families to make a difference in the lives of those children. Lord, thank you for this opportunity uh, to know how to connect with our kids. And I pray, Lord, that we would pay close attention to your word here. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. James Dobson said this, had this to say about children. Uh, first of all, he entitled his little article, Children Are Not Angels. Uh, does that surprise you? <laughs> he says a child between 18 and 36 months of age is a sheer delight, but he can also be utterly maddening. He is inquisitive, short-tempered, demanded, cuddly, innocent, and dangerous all at the same time. I find it fascinating to watch him run through his day, seeking opportunities to crush things, to flush things, to kill things, to spill things, to fall off things, to eat horrible things, and to think up ways to rattle his mother. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've ever had a, a, a child in the terrible twos that lasted into the three-agers. Uh, you know, <laughs> it just seems like uh, children uh, go through one period of growth after another, and each each time in their life is a particular challenge, is a particular uh, opportunity, uh, an opportunity for us to make a difference in their lives. Uh, you know, I, I want you to know that if you are a parent or you are a grandparent, uh, that you're in for the fight of your life. Honestly, uh, society is against you. When you think about it, uh, there's a breakdown of the family in society. The, the family of a mom and dad who love each other and who have children uh, and, and help those children grow up to, to love uh, mom and dad, to love each other and to uh, be able to be healthy and active and, and happy. Uh, society doesn't support that model much anymore. Uh, matter of fact, in society today, uh, there are a, a record number of single parents doing their best to raise their children by themselves. Uh, because perhaps the spouses haven't connected, as, as we talked about last week, and it has an effect on the children, and the children are doing their best to grow up in families that are not intact. Society is against the modern family and a mom and dad who love each other uh, and who love their children. Psycho, uh, psychology is against the modern family as well. 
uh, it, psychology teaches us today that there should never be any losers. Uh, that everybody's a winner. Uh, that no matter what you do, uh, you get a participation trophy. Uh, and and you uh, don't want to hurt your es esteem. Don't want to ever have you learn a negative lesson. Everything should be positive. Everything should be wholesome. Well, I don't know. If you'd raise your children that way, that's not preparing them for life. Because how many of us have ever had any troubles? Anybody here ever have any troubles? Has there ever been a time when you had to learn from a mistake? Has there any, ever been a time when you had to deal with a difficulty? Uh, certainly, uh, we have the opportunity to teach our children how to handle life. Because life is not always easy. There are many reasons why it's hard. Technology itself presents some challenges when you think about it. Um, oftentimes, kids, kids have more screen time than they have family time. Uh, they're before some kind of a screen, some kind of an LCD or, or what we used to say, tube. Uh, now they're not tubes anymore. I'm showing my age, aren't I? Uh, but some kind of, of frontal time with some kind of entertainment of value that keeps them out of their parents' hair. Uh, honestly, so many times the babysitters that we have for our children are little screens that are about that big or, or bigger screens in, in another room. Uh, and we want children to, uh, not only the previous generation said children should be seen and not heard, but now we don't want to see them or hear them. And we send them off uh, to find their own way. And that's not the way God wants us to raise a family. So sometimes it's the peers. Uh, honestly, immature leaders uh, have immature followers. And if you leave your child to grow up all by themselves with their own friends influencing them, then they're going to become like those friends. And you're going to be careful. I, I think every parent should be very careful about the peer group that their children are involved in, don't you? I think every parent should have a, a, a careful ear <laughs> to hear and to know the families that those other children come from so that they know that their children is getting good influence. I remember a time with my son uh, when uh, I had to tell him he could not ever see his best friend again, that he couldn't spend any time with his best friend. He saw him in school but I had to restrict his time because all the teachers in school told us if we didn't get him away from this other kid that he was going to go downhill very fast. Uh, and so we did uh, get him away from the other kid because the peer influence of this other child was so bad. The other child went on to do what we thought he would do, unfortunately. He went on to cause all kinds of problems with girls, all kinds of problems with other families. Uh, he would uh, beat on his own mother. I mean, it, it was a terrible, terrible time. And my son hated me. Absolutely hated me when I told him he couldn't be with his friend anymore. But what I went did was go home and play games with him every day. We'd go out and put, shoot baskets together. Uh, and pretty soon, my son began to ask me, come on, Dad, let's go. Let's go shoot some baskets. And pretty soon... My son turned around. But I, that peer pressure, peer pressure, if you just leave your child out there to, for any influence in the world, they will gravitate towards the bad influences. You as a parent have the opportunity to screen those, that peer group. And you have the responsibility to make sure that those kids and those families are good for your children. There are many things that war against the family. Uh, and because of that, we need to present a united front. Mom and dad need to be united. You know, that's kind of the opposite of what we see in this passage. Yeah, this uh, topic is kind of hard uh, to teach biblically. Because we don't have very many good examples of parents in the Bible. Have you ever noticed that? Now, I'm not saying there weren't good parents. Certainly, Mary and Joseph were probably very good parents for Jesus. Uh, but what I'm saying is there's not written much about good parents in the Bible, but we do read many parental mistakes in the Bible. 
Here we read one of those mistakes. Uh, look there uh, down in, in, in verse number 28. Uh, what does it say about these two twins? Uh, I, I just need a, a note in passing. Don't drink the water here at the church. If you're a young lady, the possibility you might want to have a baby, don't drink the water. There's something in the water. There are twins popping up all over the church. You know, Ruth's kid. I don't know if they drank the water when they were here or not, but it could have. I mean, there's twins all over the place around here. Well, these two twins here that we read about in this passage, these two twins uh, were very different. And because they were different, they were favored by one parent or the other. And here, uh, look there in, in verse uh, number uh, 27. The boys grew up. Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. And Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. And Rebekah loved Jacob. That's a terrible, terrible recipe for difficulty. When mom and dad are split apart when it comes to the kids. I, I believe that a, ki a kid's mantra is divide and conquer. Uh, and it's not really their fault. It's not really their fault. I mean, they're just being children. Children are, are naturally selfish, right? When you have a baby, what, what's a baby all about? Input and output, right? The bottle or the diaper, that's one or the other. I mean, that's, that's what a little baby is all about. Well, children, as they grow up, it's still a lot about what they're going to get, about getting their way, about doing what they want to do. It's, and, and they will, to their own harm, divide their parents in order to get their way. The best thing you can do for your child is to present a united front. Mom and dad together. To not allow the kids to divide you apart, to get their way. Now, I'm not saying this bad about kids. Now, we have kids here with us today. <laughs> uh, but they're exceptional. They would never do that. Right? kids that we have here today <laughs> exceptional they would never do that but it is in the nature of us to want to get our way and when you're a child and the people controlling what you do and don't do happen to be your parents if you can get them divided then you can get what you want Esau loved game because he loved game he favored I'm, I, Isaac loved games. Because Isaac loved game. He favored Esau. And Rebekah uh, loved the things around the tent, around the home. Uh, and because Jacob was there, here, Mom, let me help you with the dishes. He found favor with Rebekah. And w later, if we read the rest of the story, that leads to a great division. We got, catch just a glimpse of it at the end of this chapter when Esau sells his birthright to Jacob. But later on, we find a great division that happens. So much so that Jacob has to flee for his life, afraid of his brother, afraid of the consequences uh, that his uh, getting his way uh, has caused. Uh, we see that played out. Kids will naturally divide mom and dad. Mom and dad stay together. Stay together. Agree on what the standards are in a home. Agree on what should happen if those standards are broken. Agree out, away from the kids what kind of principles are important to your household. And live those out before the kids uh, so the kids uh, can have the security of having a united front. Parents who care for one another. Uh, I, I want you to know the united front is best when it's united with a belief and trust in God as well. Uh, in Psalms 127, it says, Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. If mom and dad are both committed to the Lord, then mom and dad have a, a common standard and a common bond that will help them to be committed to each other. What I tell folks in marriage 
classes. If you imagine uh, a love triangle, it's okay when the Lord's at the apex, okay? <laughs> but a love triangle, Lord Jesus Christ and mom and dad, the closer mom and dad get to the Lord Jesus Christ, the closer they get to each other, right? And a couple that commits their lives to the Lord have so much to agree on in life. And they will be able to more likely have a united front with the kids and be a better example to the kids if their commitment is to the Lord as well. Children need parents that will be united together. Uh, children are children, and they'll act like it, but parents need to be parents, and we need to act like it too. If there's an adult in the room, it ought to be the parent, right? <laughs> if there's two people that are going to be able to agree and be able to work together for the good of the family, it ought to be the parent's. Here in this passage, Deuteronomy chapter 6, if you would turn there, you're welcome to follow along or you can read it up on the screen. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your sons, and t shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your home and on your gates. Uh, what is that passage trying to tell us? I think one of the things it's trying to tell us is that we need to live a life worthy of emulating, a, a life. If we're parents... We need not to have different standards for our children than we have for ourselves. Uh, one of the ways that we approach that, my wife and I approach that when we were uh, young parents, is uh, if the movie wasn't fit for the kids to watch, it wasn't fit for us to watch either. Think about it. Is there some magical thing about age that makes it okay for you <laughs> to watch things you shouldn't watch when you're a kid? Now, there are times when the movie plot might not be interesting to the child and we adults might find the movie plot to be more interesting you know these boys don't care anything about the romantic comedies that my wife likes to watch <laughs> uh, they they could care less about sleepless in seattle <laughs> or you got mail or those are some of the older ones uh, but but they're not bad movies they're not bad morally. They're not breaking some of God's commandments when we watch them. We had a standard when our kids were growing up that we would not watch any R-rated movies. Uh, matter of fact, I believe our standard began with only G-rated movies until there was none. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? It's hard to find uh, movies, period. Uh, but uh, we had a standard we wouldn't watch any R-rated movies. Uh, and... When my kids went to bed, you know, we wouldn't pop in an R-rated movie that we wanted to see because if it wasn't good for the kids, it wasn't good for us either. Uh, when do you get where it's okay for us to break the law of God? Now, I know that's kind of personal. I hope I'm not stepping on too many toes here this morning, uh, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. The life we live is going to be the life that our kids learn to live. It won't be what we tell them. It will be what we do that matters. And we may think that we can hide certain things from them, but believe me, kids are smart. I would hate to be in an intelligence test right now with these three young men up here. I'm afraid I would come out on the bottom of that intelligence test. These are three bright young men. They're my grandkids. I can say stuff like that, okay? <laughs> but what a... It's, it's, they're not going to do, though, what I say. They're going to do what I do. And if I live my life properly, then I'm going to be able to relay that lifestyle onto them. 
And now how do I know how to live my life? Well, I need to get my source of information from a trustworthy source. And what does this passage say in Deuteronomy chapter 6? It talks about the laws and the standards of God. If I was to begin reading in verse 1 of Deuteronomy 6, it says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments, which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you, that you might do them in a land where you're going over to possess it, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command you all the days of your life and that your days may be prolonged. Do you hear what he's saying there? He's saying this is the standard. This is the, these are the rules. This is what you need to live your life by. And if you live your life by this, then you're going to be able to pass it on to your sons. And you're going to be able to pass it on to your grandsons. This is the standard by which we are to live. Make sure that you're getting your standard from a trustworthy source. Don't go by the latest psychological findings. Don't go by the, the, the latest social contracts. Don't go by the latest person that you see on some news program, even if they represent themselves as somebody who really knows all the answers. Go by what God's Word says. And if God's word says it's wrong, it's wrong. God's word says it's good, it's good. Go by the standards that you can trust. These standards have stood the test of time. Now it's true, Moses did not have a cell phone. He heard from God, but it wasn't through a cell phone. You see, but what God told Moses is just as applicable today as what God would tell us today. It's not, it's not that the truth has changed, the culture has changed, and technology has changed, but God's truth is timeless. It applies to every generation. It applies to every group of people. It applies to every culture. It is timeless. God's word can be counted on. It is a trustworthy source to know how to raise children. It's a trustworthy source because it tells us how to live our lives. And if we live our lives right, we will do what is best for our children. And we will be the example that we need to be. Verse, look at verse 7. Verse 7 uh, says here, You shall teach them diligently to your sons and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise up. What, what is that verse talking about? It's talking about living life together. You want to have the best influence on your kids? Live life with them. Don't send them off to live their own life someplace else, to be babysat by a, a, a boob tube, or, or to be babysat by a, a peer group that's not healthy for them. Live life with them. Spend time with them. Sure you're busy. We're all busy, right? We all have lots of things to do. But we need to invest the time in our children so that they can see how we live our lives and model then how to live their lives. Make sure we're living our lives worthy of being emulated and then invest time so that they can understand how they can live that way too. We need to spend time with our kids. Uh, it, that spending time with your kids doesn't mean enroll them in every activity that's available. You know, I, we limited our kids to uh, one sport at a time. One sport that they could be involved in. And we went and we supported them uh, by watching from the stands, by encouraging them before and after the game. But you know something we did that was even more important than the sports? Every Monday night was game night at our house. And we got out board games. And we played board games with our children. Uh, they were never bored with board games. <laughs> Matter of fact, they have a real love for them still today. Uh, because it, was, it meant family time. It meant time spent together. Another thing we did was we ate around the dinner table together. You'll be amazed at what you can find out about your kid's life if you're sitting around a dinner table. 
Uh, matter of fact, it's a good thing for couples to do as well. Uh, but to sit there without something turned on, without some distraction, without something else going on, and just talk about life. We found out all kinds of secrets and other things. <laughs> Sometimes one kid would tell on another, but sometimes a kid would just open up and just begin to talk about what was going on in their life. Uh, there's no substitute for spending time, quality time with your kids, quantity and quality uh, with no distractions. And then we did something else that was strange. We had family meetings, family meetings. Our, our kids even could call a family meeting. Uh, when they were very young, we would gather them together and, and that family time uh, would be uh, talking about what the house rules were, who we were as a family and what we did as a family and stuff like that. And as they got older, they began to put input into it. And boy, when one of them did something wrong, we would have a family meeting and we'd ask the other ones, what do you think the punishment should be? And if you weren't the one that did it wrong, the punishment got pretty extravagant. I think we should, they should be grounded for a year, at least. And maybe hung by their toes in the closet until all the blood was gone out of their body. And, and mom and dad got to be the good guys. <laughs> we got to come in and say, well, maybe not a year, but why don't we make it grounded for a couple days? Okay, I guess. How about not, instead of hanging them in the closet, why don't, why don't we just make sure they stay in their room for a few hours and think about what they did? You understand what I'm saying? It was pretty neat. We got to be the good guys because we had family meetings <laughs> in setting the rules. Uh, the family meetings were so important. Every time we made a major decision, we called the family together. And we prayed about it. We sought the Lord together. Uh, sometimes we would just introduce the idea and ask them, pray about it. And we moved clear across the country two or three times together as a family, united as a family, because we made the decisions together, following God's will as God led each of us together to make decisions like that. Oh, uh, the kids were amazingly mature in times like that when we gave them opportunity to participate in the family like that. So spend time with your kids. There's really no substitute for time. Uh, really, we need to make sure we're affecting the whole child when we begin to help them. Uh, a spoiled child, Henry Taylor says, never loves its mother. Think about that. A spoiled child never loves its mother. Because a spoiled child, it's not about mom. It's about what I get from mom. And if mom finally says, I can't do that. Well, I hate you. Because they're spoiled. Because they're spoiled. What do we need to do instead of spoiling our children? In Proverbs 22, 6, it says, Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he'll, he's old, he'll not depart from it. We, in this passage in Deuteronomy chapter 6, it approaches the ideal of making a, a difference in their mind and their body and their spirit. Love your Lord, your God, with all your, your mind, with all your, your strength, and, and, and with all of your soul. That's what we should pass on to our children. How do we do that? Well, if we're going to affect their mind, then we need to uh, educate them uh, the best that we can to, to make sure that they're learning the right things, to learn things about how to get through life, to learn the practical things about what it, facts are and, and what truth is. Uh, that's great. But boy, there's some things they're not gonna, we're not going to be able to rely on the schools to teach them. There's going to be some things that even the church can't teach them completely. There are physical lessons about physical things and there are spiritual lessons about spiritual things. And if we're going to affect their mind, we need to t share the truth of God's word. Science, quote, as is taught in our schools, and it is going to say one thing about creation. We need to share with them what the Bible says about creation. 
so that they can be prepared when they hear the other things that they may be taught outside of our home, outside of our church. Their mind, their body, their body, we need to help them to learn how to play and learn how to work. Learn how to play, enjoy the body that God has given you, and we should play games with them. We should find ways to play games with them. I, I, I was a young grandparent, and I was able to spin all my grandkids around. I, I take them by the arms. You're not supposed to do this. But I would spin them around and around, and they just love that. They just love that. That's why they're all just a little dizzy today. <laughs> uh, but I played with them, uh, and I got to enjoy them as I played with him. I played with my son when he really needed me most. What drew us together was a game of basketball. And we played night after night after night. Uh, helped him through a very difficult time in his life to play together. Uh, but to work together as well. You know, uh, I've heard it said that it's hard to hire good help nowadays. Have you ever heard that? Honestly, uh, some of the young generation don't really know how to work because they've never been taught by their parents, by their home situation. Uh, that's an important lesson that will serve them great in life later to have a work ethic. And we parents are the ones who can teach that to them. Uh, not to make our life easier because honestly, it would be easier to do it ourselves <laughs> most of the time but to help them to learn valuable lessons in life. And then the spiritual time. The spiritual time. We need to address their spirit. Uh, I, th I think we need to teach them how to have a daily walk with God. And you know how you can best teach that? When they get up in the morning, they come into the living room, there you are with an open Bible. They're learning something. You can encourage them to have time with the Lord as well. We had, with our kids, we had a family time with our kids, and we had a, a Bible story book that we would turn page by page depending on their age. Later on, we, we read some novels together as a family <clears throat> that were spiritually related. There's times that we had with the kids that were very important to teach them spiritual things. It's never too late to start with your kids. It's never too late. Start living a life that they can emulate. Start addressing their mind, uh, addressing their body, and addressing their spirit. I read a story about an ancient uh, city that was besieged. And, and this city, uh, the general of the opposing army uh, had, had two uh, brothers who had made a difference in the capture of the city. And so he promised the two brothers that they could go into town and they could grab as much treasure as they wanted. And anything they could carry out of the town was, was theirs forever. So the two brothers went into town. One of them grabbed mom. And the other grabbed dad. And they carried him out of the town. Their greatest treasure was their parents. I want to be a parent like that. Don't you? I want to connect in with my kids in such a way. I want to live such a life. I want to teach the lessons that are important for my kids so that my kids have the best chance of making it through life that they can have. Amen? So they have advantages that even I didn't have growing up. I want them to be able to grow up and be healthy and to be able to be wise and to be able to be spiritually fit for anything that life throws at them. I want them to have the best possible chance. And, and I know that that starts with me as a parent. That starts with me as a grandparent. I need to do a good job with my kids and with my grandkids. How about you? How about you? I, I think we have a unique opportunity to connect with our kids in such a real way that we can make a difference for the next generation, which will make a difference for the next generation, which will make a difference for the next generation. Isn't that right? It has to start somewhere. You know, the sins of the fathers are visited on the children to the third and fourth generation. You know, you can turn that verse around. 
the blessings of the fathers, the good life that the fathers live can be visited on the sons to the third and fourth generation as well. And what does it take to break that cycle of sin? One father to stand up someplace and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Are you willing to be that parent today? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. What about you and your house? Will you do your best wherever you're at right now? Do your best from tomorrow forward. Do your best to be the parent, grandparent, aunt, or uncle that God would have you to be and make a difference in these young lives. Father, we thank you for the opportunity that you give us to make a difference. And as a father who came this morning and shared the concerns over a son, Father, I know we all have concerns over those that we love in our families, whether they be sons or daughters or nieces or nephews or, or whether they even be parents. Father, we, we have concerns. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be the people we need to be to establish our lives upon your truth and your ways and, and to live it out so that others can see that it's not just what we say that's true, but it's a life that we live that's true as well. Father, I pray that you would give us the wisdom to connect with our kids, to connect in such an important way that they can learn how to connect with you. And we'll give you the praise and glory for it. In Jesus' name, amen.